from various fields of knowledge. This year, we are proud that Professor Partha Chakachi has kindly agreed to deliver Dr. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture 2023 in the backdrop of 100 years of teaching in anthropology at this university of the University of at this department of the University of Calcutta. Uh, uh, each year, uh, we normally organize this uh, Memorial Lecture in our department, but the overwhelming response that we have caught uh, compelled us to uh, shift here in the Kennedy Hall. And, uh, uh, for the, and for this uh, we also extend our sincere thanks to the Department of Jute and Fiber Technology as well. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Chair in Anthropology at Calcutta University was founded in 1996 with a mandate of anthropological research works on the disadvantaged section of the population in the light of Ambedkar's ideas. Since its inception, the Chair has done many remarkable works in, his, in this regard. Until recently, Ambedkar's contribution to anthropology was not emphasized properly by the Indian Anthropological Fraternity. But he was an astute anthropologist, as evident from his writings and speeches, dealing with caste and untouchability problem from time to time. In his student days, he wrote the paper titled Caste in India, Their Mechanism, Genesis and Development, read before anthropology seminar of Dr. A. A. Golden Boys of Columbia University, 1916, where he launched his research. Baba Sahib Stahel stated that the Brahmins were the organizers of an unnatural institution like Sati for the widows and the child marriages for the widows, widowers. Uh, they wanted to be apart from the rest and therefore vetoed their marriages outside their own caste. Manu, the lawgiver of ancient India, came to their support, to their support uh, sanctioning a fact that had already been in force for a long time. He writes, philosophies flourish after the movement has started to justify them. The Shastras, holy books of Hindu traditions and philosophies of the sort, the second phase of Ambedkar's uh, anthropological work was marked by the annihilation of caste of speech written for the 1936 annual conference of Jatpat Torak Mandal of Lahore, but not delivered, but it was published in Mumbai, 1936. Here we can surmise at once that the image of objectiveness has strayed from the previous work of the student days, of course, and I say that, and finally, we find two works of anthropological interest. One, who are the Shudras and how they became, how they came into, came to be the fourth burner in the indo indian society, where Baba Sahib argued that Shudras were actually Kshatriyas of the solar system of Manu Vivasa, uh, who, because of their quarrels with their Brahmins were refused the initiation ceremony of Upanayana by the Brahmins themselves, thus becoming the fourth part. And the, uh, the most fascinating work that I found, the, that is the untouchables, who were they and why they became untouchables, here we find the fascinating concept of broken man, a congregation of excommunicated, or stranded individuals from both sides, sedentary and nomadic, to explain the origin of the problem of untouchability. He maintained that what existed at first was not untouchability but temporary impurity, just as in the primitive societies, which could be easily dispelled by the purification rites. In all the Sriti texts, he quotes, there is no mention of permanent impurity or untouchability. It was institutionalized much later. We have dedicated this year's Dr. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture to the completion of 100 years of teaching in anthropology at Calcutta University. As we know, as we know that the Department of Anthropology at Calcutta University completed its 100 years of journey 
in 2018 and it is true that we still do not have an authentic compilation of the history of the department to date. Recollecting our own past unbiased is extremely important to invite the present generation of students and scholars with the department's heritage so that we can pay proper homage to the pioneers based on actual interpretation. Since joining as a HOD, I have been trying to find out ways and means to conduct meaningful research on the history of our department from archival resources and oral traditions, oral histories a few living legends. And I hope our departmental colleagues along with uh, our librarian would be helping me in this pursuit. Uh, with the cooperation of all concerned, we will definitely be able to compile an authentic account of the history of anthropological teaching and research in our department. We are also contemplating the lecture series to mark the 100 years of teaching in anthropology at Calcutta University and today's lecture will be the first of this series. Now ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will definitely listen to Professor Chakra Chok Chatterjee's um, Chatterjee with rapt attention, uh, but now it is my duty to put, uh, which put me in a terrible position to introduce a speaker who needs no introduction. Here, I will stick to the official website version of the part, which that partly reflects uh, Professor uh, Chatterjee's versatility. As we all know that Professor Professor Chatterjee is a political theorist, political anthropologist and historian. He graduated from Presidency College, Calcutta, received his PhD from the University of Rochester. Since 1997, he has divided his time between Columbia University and the Center of Studies in uh, Social Studies, the Center of Studies in Social Sciences called Calcutta where he was the director from 1997 to 2007. He was the author of more than 30 books and edited volumes in English and Bengali. He was one of the founding members of Subaltern Studies Collective. His books include The Black Hole of Empire, uh, Lineages of Political Society, Politics of, of the Government, The Princely Imposter, The Strange and Universal the history of the Kumar of Bawal, the nation and its fragments, the nationalist thoughts of the, and the colonial world, and many more. Chatterjee delivered the Ruth Benedict Lectures in April 2018, published in an expanded version as I Am the People, Reflections on Popular Sovereignty Today. His most recent book is the edited, I don't know whether it's the most recent books, I will possibly can tell. Uh, is the edited uh, version of a, of a found uh, manuscript titled The Truths and Lies of Nationalism as narrated by Charbak. He is also a playwright whose play Chokhet Bali, Sandy Marai, was staged in Barnard College in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Chatterjee will be delivering the lecture titled Science and the Science of Cultural Interpretation, Anthropology at Calcutta University. And let me leave the podium uh, for the Memorial Lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Chatterjee. Uh, Thank you, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me to deliver this, uh, <coughs> this lecture. I remember it was, I think, 2019 when uh, a delegation from this department came to meet me uh, and uh, you were planning the centenary uh, celebrations. Uh, for the department and you have requested me to deliver a, a lecture uh, and then before any uh, plans could be actually finalized uh, the pandemic broke out and of course everything was suspended and so finally here we are again uh, almost four years later uh, so um, I'm very happy that we are been able to meet. Uh, when I uh, 
with Professor Bakshi and I think uh, Professor Maiti. Uh, we discussed this sometime last year. I, I was wondering what I should speak on. And then uh, I realized that the, uh, the department library here, uh, and especially the librarian whom I had known for a long time, uh, he uh, told me that they have been able to organize some of the uh, early material from the department, department journals and other papers of the department, uh, which had been organized in, in, in the department library. And so I came and over the last three months I have paid many visits to the department library. Uh, and I it gradually uh, worked out into a full length paper, which I will now present to you, on the early history of anthropology uh, in this department. It is also, in, in some ways, also a history of the discipline of anthropology in, in India uh, in, say, between the 1920s and the 1970s. So it's about the first 50 years of your department. Uh, this is the history which Professor Bhakti was uh, referring to that uh, you now want to put together. I can assure you that, in fact, the uh, department uh, papers are in a fairly good condition. And certainly some uh, researchers can uh, work on them uh, and put together a very informative history. So, effectively then my topic is the first 50 years of the Calgary University Department. I only recently came to realize that this lecture would also be the B.R. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture. Uh, I haven't included any uh, you know, significant observations on Ambedkar's uh, <coughs> considerable readings and writings on topics of anthropology. Professor Bhakti just referred to some of his, uh, his writings. Uh, I am familiar with much of it, including his uh, uh, term papers and so on from Columbia University, which there is a whole uh, website in fact I helped put it, put it together. It's, it's now available on the Columbia website. There is a special website for Ambedkar. Uh, but I will make a few remarks on Ambedkar in relation to some of the subjects that I will talk about. So, Origins. The postgraduate anthropology department of the University of Calcutta was established in 1921. The person who took charge <coughs> as reader in anthropology was L. K. Ananta Krishna Iyer, who was already teaching in the department of ancient Indian history and, and who had earlier distinguished himself as an ethnologist in the princely state of Kochi. Ayer had come to Kolkata in 1914 as president of the ethnology section of the Indian Science Congress. This was the very first session of the Congress held at the Asiatic Society and inaugurated by Ashutosh Mukherjee, then Vice Chancellor of the University of Calcutta. It is said that Ayer caught the attention of Sir Ashutosh at this meeting leading to an invitation to join the university. Ayer was the head of the anthropology department until 1932. There were no trained Indian anthropologists at this time. The first teachers of the department were drawn from scholars who were then teaching prehistory and archaeology in the ancient Indian history department. Thus, Ramaprasad Chondo, Haranchandra Chakladar, and Tarun Chandra Dash all moved from that department to anthropology. It was also a time when the university's plan to expand its postgraduate program was facing great difficulty because of a standoff with the provincial government. Responding to repeated requests from the university for additional funds to meet the expenses of the postgraduate departments, the government of Bengal in 1922 offered some financial assistance, but tied it to a series of conditions which would not only have stalled any further expansion 
of postgraduate education, but subjected the, the university to government control. Led by Ashutosh Mukherjee, who had returned as Vice Chancellor after a gap of seven years to serve his fifth term in office, the Senate and Syndicate of the University fiercely resisted this attempt to diminish its autonomy. Speaking in the Senate, Salam Ashutosh expressed his position in dramatic terms. Quote, I take it from, take it from me that as long as there is one drop of blood in me, I will not participate in the humiliation of this university. This university will not be a manufactory of slaves. What will posterity say? Will not future generations cry shame that the Senate of the University of Calcutta bartered away their freedom for two and a half lakhs of rupees? We will not take the money. Our postgraduate teachers will starve themselves rather than give up their freedom. Strong words. In the end, the teachers fortunately did not have to starve, even though their salaries were often in arrears. A series of generous gifts from private donors made it possible for the postgraduate departments to create new chairs and construct a new building at Rajavajar for its science departments. Also one in Balayans. I will show you, this was the Rajavajar more or less the same even today. But this you will find very strange. This was the Balayan Science College as it looked before the present building came up. This is a photo from the 1950s. Speaking of the contribution of the University of Calcutta to anthropology, we must, remem we must remember that Henry Main, the celebrated author of ancient law and village communities in the East and the West, and a founding figure in the discipline, was the vice chancellor of this university from 1863 to 1867. His formulation of the evolution of communities from status to contract was for a long time an important idea in shaping the comparative study of legal institutions in different stages of social change. The anthropology department at the University of Calcutta was, of course, a relatively small department. In 1921, compared to 336 students in English, 320 in philosophy, 180 in political economy, and 177 in history, anthropology had only 22 students. <coughs> this is a view of the Central, central uh, Library of the University. This is again 1950s. And interestingly, you had men and women reading separately, right? separate sections of the time. Uh, AAIR, the departmental head, was a pioneer in Indian anthropology. This is AAIR sitting uh, with his wife. The person standing is uh, Ayer's son. AAIR, the departmental head, was a pioneer in Indian anthropology. His career illustrated the circumstances in which the first Indian scholars had to negotiate their way in a field that was until then exclusively dominated by British colonial officials and European missionaries. Indeed, the discipline itself had been constructed as one in which a Western observer studies a foreign culture that displays in its material life, customs, and even physical features the marks of earlier stages of human social evolution. How was an Indian ethnologist to study his own society with the same disciplinary tools? Ayer came to acquire those tools somewhat by accident. In 1902, when he was a science teacher in Maharaja's College at Nakula, he was asked to carry out in a purely honorary capacity an ethnographic survey of Cochin. The princely state had been told to do this by the imperial government as part of the ongoing ethnographic survey of the country, and the secretary to the Dewan of the state 
decided that in the absence of any recognized ethnographer in his service, Ayer would be the most appropriate person for the job. Armed with the format designed by Herbert Grinsley for the 1901 census of India, Ayer went out to do field work on the weekends and during his college vacations. In the next 10 years, he published three volumes of the Kochi Tribes and Castes, which established his reputation as the most accomplished Indian scholar in the field and brought him recognition as the first president of the ethnology section of the Indian Science Congress. While teaching in Calcutta, Ayur was invited in 1924 by the princely state of Mysore to conduct its ethnographic survey, a task which he carried out during his vacations and completed in four volumes in 1935 after his retirement from the University of Calcutta. <laughs> Even though Aya took up an assignment conceived and designed within what we now recognize to be a quintessentially colonial form of knowledge, he was not just a passive go-between. He decided to simplify Risley's elaborate instructions, focusing on the internal structure of the community, its marriage and inheritance rules, life cycle ceremonies, religious beliefs and practices, occupation, dress, and ornaments. More significantly, he completely dispensed with the prevalent <coughs> practice of sending out administrative circulars to local officials and uh, with instructions to collect information on the basis of a fixed schedule. Instead, he went out into the villages himself and carried out his own interviews. That way, as far as the survey of Kuchin was concerned, he was able to use his native fluency in the local language to good advantage. In Mysore, he used a local interpreter. He also made a major amendment to Risley's method by completely omitting the anthropometric parts of the ethnological survey. In both of these departures from prevailing practice, I have shown his distaste for the inherently intrusive and coercive methods of information collection that was so much a feature of the bureaucratic structure of colonial ethnology. But Ayer's career also reveals an aspect in which the Indian anthropologist, who was in this period invariably an upper caste male, had to negotiate the deep ethnic divides within his own society. It is significant that of the dozens of ethnographic studies carried out by the first generation of Indian anthropologists, the vast majority was focused on the so-called tribal communities. Here, a modern intellectual elite was discovering little known facts about other people in its own country who had been kept at a distance, separated by centuries of prejudice and suspicion. Curiously, therefore, the very structure of a colonial scientific discipline, strongly influenced by then prevailing theories of social evolution, reinforced the civilizational superiority of the Indian elite, while satisfying at the same time the spirit of rational inquiry. When it came to the study of caste society, early Indian anthropologists put to use the one skill in which they excelled colonial officials, their knowledge of the vast body of Sanskrit and regional language texts, which they deployed to describe the history of caste society, its regional variations, and the ritual and legal aspects of caste practices. Here too, the scientific discipline of ethnology buttressed the intellectual superiority of a modern upper caste elite even as it employed traditional Brahminical scholarship in the service of rational knowledge. Even though Ayer had managed to avoid the question, other members of the anthropology department at the University of Calcutta became intensely entangled in the disputes that raged in the country at the time over the racial characteristics of the Indian population. By the 1920s, the Indian debate had come to be influenced by racial theories circulating among Western scholars, theories that were supposed to be based on science rather than theology. An important precursor 
was the early 19th century idea of polygenesis, which regarded, disregarded the biblical story of the origin of the human species from a single couple created by God, and asserted that different races of humans had originated separately, constituting separate species. Even though Charles Darwin himself pronounced in favor of a single origin of the human species, species by natural selection, his intervention shook the faith of both monogenists and polygenists in the physical stability of the races. But soon, more nuanced theories emerged in the late 19th century, which ranked the different races on an evolutionary scale, with the white Caucasian or Nordic at the top, the dark-skinned Negrito at the bottom, and races such as Mongoloid, Ethiopian, American, and others at various points in between. By the turn of the century, a scientific consensus seemed to emerge that the most stable distinction among races was to be found in the so-called cephalic index, the mean ratio of breadth to length of the skull. With this was often combined measures of the nose and the jaw, as well as the color of the eyes and hair. Based on such somatological measures, finer distinctions began to be made within races. Thus, Europeans were divided into the Nordic or Teutonian or Aryan, same term, or an Alpine and Mediterranean races. Even though these were merely statistical averages, indicating the typical shape of the head of a certain population group, qualities such as beauty, intelligence, cultural skills, civilizational attainments, etc., came to be attached to them in an emerging ideological discourse of national chauvinism, colonial conquest, and imperial rivalry. Today, when race science has been discredited, and no one uses the methods of comparative stomatology to distinguish the races anymore, it is important for us to remember that these theories and methods once enjoyed considerable authority in scientific circles, and those who proposed and used them were some of the best scientists of their time. To dismiss these theories as pseudoscience is to ignore the fact that despite have been embedded in the ideological formations of the day, they were upheld by many professional scientists, not for ideological reasons, but on what they believed to be good scientific grounds. This was the stamp of authority that race science carried when it reached the new intellectual elite of a colonized country like India in the early 20th century. The most influential figure here was H. H. Risley, who carried out the ethnographic survey of Bengal, edited the ethnographic chapters of the 1901 census of India, and finally summarized his views in his book, The People of India. According to him, the original inhabitants of southern India belonged to the Dravidian race, while the Mongoloids were the original people of the Northeast. The Scythians, or Shakas, came into India from Central Asia and settled in the western parts of the country, and the Aryans invaded and occupied the north. The resulting admixtures produced seven basic racial types, Mongoloid, Dravidian, Indo-Aryan, Turco-Iranian, Mongolo-Dravidian, Aryo-Dravidian, and Sitho-Dravidian. His supporting evidence was drawn from anthropometric data on the skull size, nasal, nasal index, skin color, and stature of numerous groups across India based on sample sizes as small as 30 and never larger than 100. He insisted that despite a fair amount of migration and racial mixing, the relative stability of caste endogamy meant that unlike in Europe, it was possible to use anthropometric measures, methods in India to identify the basic racial types. Indeed, caste distinctions were of a secondary order, derived from a more fundamental racial order. 
Hence, the prevailing social ideas regarding caste prestige could be shown to correspond to physical difference. Thus, Rizli said, if castes were arranged, quote, in the order of the average nasal index, so that the caste with the finest nose shall be at the top and with the coarsest nose at the bottom of the list, it will be found that this order substantially corresponds with the accepted order of social precedence. Rizli's racial theory also claimed to provide a scientific basis for the common perception of regional differences among the Indian population in terms of distinctions in physical appearance. Once again, we should remember that men like Rizli, even though their entire career was spent in the colonial bureaucracy, thought of themselves not merely as official functionaries producing knowledge about India, but as participants in a worldwide community of scientists engaged in the study of human society. Race for them was a scientific concept, the latest discovery in the new science of ethnology, which applied universally to human society everywhere, from its origins to its present diversity. Among the early members of the anthropology department at Patkaratha University, Ram Prasad Chando, H.C. Chakradar and Ponchanal Mitro all participated in the debates around Rizli's racial classification. The 1920 and 21 volumes of the university's Journal of the Department of Letters have contributions by all three. Ponchanal Mitro wrote about recent discoveries of prehistoric archaeology and ethnology on Neolithic Indian cultures, which he said challenged inferences about Aryanism drawn from mythology and philosophy. Chakrana translated an Italian article by the anthropologist V. Gifrida Ruggieri, in which the latter presented data on stature, cephalic index, and nasal index of living subjects to arrive at six ethnic classes among Indians, the Grito, Pre-Dravidian, Dravidian, Tall, Dolicocephalic, Aryan, Dolicocephalic area and Brachycephalic Leucoderm. The career of Ramakrishnan Chondo, sorry, Another example of how some of these Indian scholars came to anthropology. As a school teacher in Rajshahi, Chandu was drawn to nearby archaeological sites. He soon began to publish articles in Bengali and English. In 1912, he published Gogo Rajmala on the early dynastic dynasties that ruled Bengal, and in 1916, Indo Aryan races on the basis of which he got a job in the Archaeological Survey of India. In 1919, he joined the Ancient Indian History Department at the University of Calcutta and the following year moved to anthropology. In his article in the Journal of the Department of Letters, Chandra pointed out that because of the widespread practice in India of the cremation of the dead, it was necessary to rely on anthropometric studies of living subjects to arrive at a classification of racial types. He then surveyed the available evidence and proposed five types. The pre dravidian or Nishad was the most primitive stratum to be found among the tribes of Central and South India. The proto dravidian were the long-headed cultured speakers of Dravidian languages in South India. Chandra noted that Franz Boas had recently shaken the earlier faith in the reliability of the cranial index as a marker of race, but that, he said, had been countered by the discovery that the head shape of Egyptians was stable over 6,000 years. 
the modified grizzly stub into area for the dominant population of Hindustan proper to Indo Afghan, since the head shape of the original Aryans was unknown. The Indo Afghans, he said, probably represent the Vedic Aryas and are now to be found in northwestern India, the typical representative being the Kashmiri Brahmin. The Pamirian or Tajik type was to be found in Bengal and Gujarat. Curiously, he claimed that Bengalis and Gujaratis, like the Tajik, quote, have a predilection for peaceful occupations, which is a race heritage. Finally, the Indo-Mongolian race was to be found on the plains of the eastern Himalayas. Chandra's article shows how the principles of race science developed in the West modified by a patchy collection of Indian anthropometric data, were colored by speculative influences from commonly held cultural assumptions in the work of early Indian anthropologists. Surveying the contributions of the first generation of anthropologists at the University of Calcutta, Nirmal Kumar Ghosh, himself a distinguished member of the department, wrote in 1963 that their work had been, quote, on the whole, conservative and slow in arriving at conclusions, they were following the path laid down by Western scholars. The curriculum. What did the students learn in the anthropology department at the University of Calcutta? Fortunately, we have a full record of the syllabi of the MA and MSc degrees from the founding of the department in 1920 all the way to the 1970s. In the early years, there were two compulsory papers each on physical and cultural anthropology in which the books taught were by Risley and R. P. Chondo. Among the elective papers were racial history of the Caucasian peoples of Asia, North Africa and Europe, social anthropology of primitive tribes of India, social anthropology of religious and social institutions of the Indian people, Vedic, Puranic, Tantric, and folk religions, and caste and the caste codes, where Sanskrit and Pali texts and the castes and tribes volumes of different provinces were taught. In addition, there were practical papers on laboratory, museum, and field work in physical and cultural anthropology. In 1923, the elective racial history paper was modified to include race, race, uh, race characteristics, physical characters to distinguish the various races and sub-races of man. In 1927, the elective caste and caste code included intensive study of select tribes, namely Orao, Munda, Ho, Santal, etc. From 1928, we noticed a distinct emphasis on training students in the new scientific theories of race and the methods of anthropometry. A compulsory course was introduced on evolutionary biology and racial somatology. In 1935, the elective racial history paper was replaced by anthropometry and biometry. The practical paper on physical anthropology now included human and anthropoid osteology, and students were required to measure 25 men and three skeletons. While the practical paper in cultural anthropology included identification of stone objects and technological specimens. In 1938, the practical papers were again rearranged to include somatometry, osteometry, and the statistical treatment of anthropological data. Of the teachers who taught these subjects, several were trained in the department. T.C. Rajoudhury, who was earlier a student in the department, taught somatometry and racial characteristics. Prafulla Chandra Bishash, also a former student who later studied in Berlin, taught in the department for a short time, and then went on to found the Department of Anthropology at the University of Delhi. Virendra Mojunda, another former student, went on to join the famous sociology department at the University of Lucknow earn a doctoral degree from Cambridge and become a leading figure in anthropometric and serological studies. 
Bill was a strong book who a distinguished figure in Indian anthropology who got his doctoral degree from Harvard University, taught in the department for a short time before leaving for the anthropology section of the Zoological Survey of India to finally become the founding director of the Anthropological Survey of India. Shoshan Kotek was Shokar, the first DSC from the department, taught there for many years and became a leading figure in serological studies. Caste and race. Given the ubiquity of the social institution of caste in India, it was inevitable that the anthropologist's study of the racial composition of the Indian population would become tied with the caste question. Risley, as we have already mentioned, thought that the racial divisions were more fundamental than caste divisions. But his view was contested. J. H. Hutton, a civil servant who wrote two monographs on the Nagas to earn a DSC from the University of Oxford and who supervised the 1931 census of India, offered a more complex account. Different races had moved into India over centuries. The earliest were the Negrito, who were now to be found only among a few hundred survivors in the Andaman Islands. The pre dravidian or proto australoid race exists among the primitive peoples of central India and among lower class and humbler classes of society. In particular, the speakers of Austrian languages such as the Munda and the Khasi show in their physique strong proto australoid elements. The Dravidian languages now spoken in the south were once spoken all over India and most probably entered from Mesopotamia. Quote, the, there are many cultural parallels between South India and the older civilizations of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Crete. And it is probable that many waves of immigrations have taken place, all more or less of the same type of people. Later, two racially distinct migrations took place from the southern Russian steppes and Iran. A wave of round-headed people entered India around 3000 BCE from the north northwest and went down the west coast as far as Kul and then trickled into Telugu and Tamil country. Another section moved into Bengal. The second wave of migration which occurred from 1500 BCE was by the so-called Aryan people of the Rig Veda who had fair hair and blue eyes. These Indo-European invasions were followed by smaller invasions by Persians, Greeks, Shakas, and Kurat Kushans. The Muslim invasion began in the 8th century. The northeastern parts of India were populated by Mongolite people who became mixed with other racial types. Despite these waves of migration from the outside and their internal movement of populations, Indian society was held together over the centuries, according to Atan by the flexibility of the caste system. Each caste is an endogamous unit, but castes, noted Hutton, could rise or fall in status, split, change character with changes in occupation, move from one region to another, new castes could be created to accommodate new arrivals, even Muslims, Jews, and Christians have adopted the caste system. Because of the relative fluidity rather than absolute rigidity of the system, the differences among the 3,000 or so castes, insofar as they are racial, are, in Hutton's view, rather differences of degrees of mixture than absolute differences of race and type. Indeed, Hutton agreed with B.S. Go, who wrote the chapter on race for the 1931 census, that it was easier to differentiate between Indian racial types by region than by caste. Guha himself carried out a morphological survey of India and classified the basic racial types as Negrito, proto australoid Mongoloid, Mediterranean, and Nordic. Guha's classification was accepted by most physical anthropologists of India for a long time. The Hutton Guha account for the physical anthropology of race and caste in the 1931 census was subjected to blistering criticism by Bhupendra Dotto in the Anthropology Department's journal in 1935. 
Bhakto, the younger brother of Shami Vivekananda, had a remarkable career. Spending a year in prison for his links with the revolutionary group Jugantar, he escaped from surveillance and reached the United States where he graduated from New York University and then took a master's degree from Brown University. Moving to Germany to carry out revolutionary activities, he also studied anthropology and earned a doctoral degree from the University of Hamburg in 1923. Returning to India, he took part in the civil disobedience movement and then became a leader of the left wing Kishan Shabha. He joined the anthropology department of the University of Calcutta in 1934, but only stayed there for a few years. In his critique, Doctor took issue with Hutton's claim in the census report that the Namasundra caste of Bengal had evolved from a Mediterranean strain from the West, while the Muslim cultivators of Eastern Bengal had a mix of Mongoloid and proto australoid strains. Doctor cited satanic index data to show that there is no physical difference between Namasundra, Ford, and Muslim cultivators. He went on to assert that the, quote, the Indian caste system has no racial basis, that the social status of a caste does not stand in inverse ratio with the nasal index as claimed by this He also called Gruar Guru's claim about the presence of the Negrito race in India and through anthropological obscurantism. Doctor suggested that the spirit of the English-speaking school hung over the census report whereas German anthropologists had come to very different conclusions. Thus, they had shown that there is no Negrito element in southern India, that no separate Dravidian race migrated from outside, and that the Indo-Aryans had evolved from the Dravidian and Australoid tribes. In fact, Dr. claimed that Dravidian was only a language group. There was no Dravidian race. <coughs> Inciting German anthropologists against British, against British, Gouverneur Dr. Shaw, the influence on him of the Berlin School of Ethnology, founded by Robert Wirtschau and Adolf Bastian, which argued against prevailing race theories by asserting that biological traits cut across conventional racial classifications, and that racial mixing is widespread, if not universal. Moreover, like races, all cultures are historically diverse, dependent on borrowings and always in flux. <coughs> this view would travel to the United States and become very influential in the early 20th century in the anthropology of Franz Boas. I'll come to that in a minute. Later, Obelna Dato expanded these observations in his book, Studies in Indian Social Policy. Reiterating that all castes are mixed in their composition and that they do not represent different biotypes, he declared the common idea that the four burners originally represented four biotypes to be absurd. On the Indo Aryans, he noted that many scholars had identified the speakers of Indo European languages with a common race even though they were clearly not homogeneous in their somatic characteristics. Language had been confounded with race. <coughs> All we know is that the Vedic tribes called themselves Arya and called their enemies Dasu, Dasa or Asura. But this does not tell us anything about their anthropological character. It is quite probable that the speakers of Vedic Sanskrit were not racially homogeneous. They were merely a cultural ethnic group. Doctor also submitted Risley's own data on the head forms of different castes in Punjab and Bengal to statistical analysis to show that each caste was a racially mixed group. By the way, since we have mentioned Ambedkar, Ambedkar also argued very, very strongly that uh, castes had no racial basis. Race and caste were completely separate. <coughs> we must emphasize the important significance of this unapologetic rejection of an official view claiming to represent scientific expertise and published in the most authoritative anthropological report of the government by a member of a university department in colonial India. 
Clearly, Bhupendra Doctor did not suffer from any conservative diffidence, nor was he faithfully treading the path shown by British experts, as Nirmal Bosch observed about the anthropologists at Calcutta University. Undoubtedly, it was Doctor's political background which allowed him to take a stance that his academic colleagues would not dare attempt. Cultural anthropology. Although cultural anthropology was a part of the department curriculum from the very beginning, it was tied with archaeology and linguistics and was not a significant area of research in the department in its early phase. Kirish Prashad Chattopadhyaya, who had studied with W.H.R. Rivers in Cambridge, joined the department in 1923 but soon left to become education officer in the Calcutta Corporation, in which role he set up the chain of corporation schools in the city to offer free private education. He returned to the anthropology department in 1935 and became its first professor in 1940. The most influential figure in the early history of the department was Nirmal Kumar Bosch. Uh, a graduate in geology, he joined the non-cooperation movement and went to prison. He then took a master's degree from the anthropology department in 1923 and joined it as assistant lecturer, but left in 1930 to get involved once more in the freedom movement. In 1937, he resumed his interrupted teaching career in anthropology only to leave it again when he went to prison in 1942. In 1946, he joined the geography department of the University of Calcutta, but then took up the official positions of director of the Anthropological Survey of India and commissioner of scheduled castes and tribes. Nirmal Bosch, once again, was someone who interrupted his academic career with intense political activity and thus did not feel bound by inherited professional traditions. In 1929, Bosch wrote Cultural Anthropology as a textbook for students in Indian universities. Introducing the book, he posed a question that would have been very unusual in a Western university at the time. Quote, this is Nirmal Bosch, in what way will the social sciences prove to be of practical use? How will they guide us in the work of reform? If a social worker ventures on reform before being equipped with the necessary information regarding human nature and civilization, his efforts are more likely to fail than to succeed, however greatly he may be inspired by idealism. Bosch did not hide his belief in the link, perhaps even an instrumental link, between knowledge and purposeful social action. The Darwinian revolution, he pointed out, had established the close biological connection between humans and animals. Anthropology, he said, is the study of the man-animal in society. Humans share most of their instincts with animals, but the faculty of reason enables them to learn from their experience to shape their behavior. Cultural anthropology studies the crystallized products of human behavior passed on from generation to generation and from group to group. The key, the key concept both introduced was that of the cultural trait, the key material element that shapes aspects of the family and social system, religion, mythology, art, and government of a group and distinguishes it from other groups. An example is the rice culture of Bengal, in which a large number of material, ceremonial, and magical practices are brought together around the principal staple food of the people. Cultural traits help us to judge the influence of one culture over another and of finding the path of diffusion of a particular trait. Such trait complexes can vary over time, new elements may be added, old ones may drop out or be modified. Both gave examples from the variations over time of the Holy Festival in Bengal and the Jagannath cult in Puri. Anthropologists may track such changes by identifying a stable cultural center and then tracing the paths of diffusion, conduction, and attenuation of cultural traits.
with his book, Nirmal Brosh brought to students of anthropology in India the trend against evolutionism, which had begun in Germany and then took the shape of a movement in the United States with Franz Boas and his students, uh, such as Alfred Kroeber, Robert Louis, Ruth Benedict, and Margaret Mead. Known as diffusionism, Boasian anthropology argued against the evolutionary view of the progress of human societies everywhere, from savagery to civilization, and refuted racial explanations of cultural difference. The idea of the diffusion of cultural traits as a better explanation than evolutionary models of change in social practices was forcefully propagated by Boas. <coughs> Nirmal Bosch introduced this idea into the study of cultural change in India. In his own work, Bosch began with the study of Odisha temples, but instead of following the conventional architectural analysis introduced by Western scholars, he chose to look into the manuals and practices followed by local craftsmen. He also wrote on the domestic architecture of Western Bengal, where the convex straw roof or chala was different in shape from those in Odisha or Eastern Bengal, and whose form was carried over into the Greek temples of the region. He was a great advocate of intensive fieldwork and wrote in the style of Kroger an ethnography of the Juan of Keonchan, who despite being a hunting gatherer people, had taken to making bamboo articles and selling them in nearby markets. His Gandhian outlook led him to believe that caste discrimination could be reformed through social work and that the tribes could be brought within the larger fold by introducing them to modern occupations. Race modified. With K.P. Chakrabandha at its head, the department put greater emphasis from the 1940s on practical training in both physical and cultural anthropology. Thus, human and primate osteology, somatometry, osteometry, Pleistocene paleoanthropology, uh, statistical analysis of anthropological data, museum methods, and fieldwork became integral parts of the curriculum. Further, most topics were taught with reference to Indian conditions. On the research side, the most noteworthy work was carried out by Shashank Pashik of Sarkar, who joined the department in 1957 after leaving the Anthropological Survey of India. Trained in Berlin, Sarkar had established himself in a new field of seroanthropology, studying blood groups to establish the racial characteristics of castes and tribes, and publishing in international journals. Working alongside Eileen McFarland, the pioneer in the field in India, L.D. Sangvi in Bombay, Iravati Kalve in Pune, and Zeeen Majumdar in Lucknow, he was in the forefront of a new wave of race science, even as it was coming under fire from cultural anthropologists. Scientists in the field now acknowledge that the racial types identified earlier was seldom found in pure form in any human group, and that in actual fact, all groups had mixed racial characteristics. But the statistical estimation of these racial characteristics in specific populations could still have enormous scientific value. With the UNESCO declaring in 1950 that any theory which bases value judgments on racial differentiation or claims superior or inferior status for racial groups has no scientific foundation, and that race was less a biological fact than a social myth. The old concept of race was rendered unacceptable. But with the shift from racial types to population, and from Darwinian evolution to Mendelian inheritance, race science assumed new forms. Shankar was an important figure in this transition in India. Prajit Gyari Mukherjee has recently pointed out that Shankar was in the 1940s a key figure in the Indian Eugenics Society in Canada. Explicitly following the lead of the Eugenics Movement in Europe 
and the United States. The society sought the practical application of human genetics and racial hygiene to improve the survival capacity of the Indian population, quote, in the struggle for existence. In a publication of the society in 1941, Shorkar had taken issue with the attempt to raise the age of marriage of girls by arguing that there was no sound scientific data to show that early childbirth was bad for the health of mothers or children. He also prepared a list of about a hundred heritable diseases which he said should be prevented from being passed on to the next generation. He also made a plea for scientifically studying the pedigree of great men and devised ways to ensure the continuity of their germplasms and thus of an intelligence. Shorka reiterated these arguments in his 1951 presidential address to the anthropology section of the Indian Science Conference in Bangalore, but within a new plan for national eugenics. He claimed that biological research had shown that feeding bottles could make children deaf and mute, that married people live longer than the unmarried, that breast cancer and heart disease are more frequent among unmarried women and that normally reproductive women are comparatively free from disease. He thought it was necessary to scientifically determine the age of puberty to have compulsory medical examinations before every marriage and create a central database of hospital statistics on heritable diseases and to seriously study the incidence of inherited talent within castes and races. He mentioned intersexes or hermaphrodites as a group that should be separately studied as a topic of human biology. He did not accept that India was overpopulated. In fact, he pointed out that the Hindu practice of not permitting widow remarriage was leading to a population, to a population loss compared to Muslims. Alongside these remarks, which will seem unacceptable if not outlandish to us today, Shankar did anticipate some future developments. Fingerprints, he said, should be made compulsory on identity papers, such as insurance policies and passports. Referring to the sensational Bhawal Shundaki case, he said that had the Kumar of Bhawal put a fingerprint on his life insurance policy, the dispute over his identity would have been settled in 10 minutes. He dismissed the talk of mixed races and the substitution of race by neutral terms such as ethnic group as misguided. Races were dynamic rather than stable, form, quote, formed by mating groups differentiated by unified selective response at the environmental, genetic, and cultural levels. To understand the dynamic nature of races in India, one must carefully study the changing reproductive isolation of different castes and tribes. In spite of the widespread criticism of eugenics after the Second World War, Sarkar did not shy away from his view that it was a science that could contribute to the improved health of the nation. He lamented the closure by the Allied authorities of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology, Human Heredity and Eugenics in Berlin, where Shokar had held a research position in 1938-39. He ended his presidential address by affirming the biostatistician Carl Pearson's claim that, quote, the progress of the race inevitably demands a dominant fertility in the fitter stocks. If statesmen do not accept this principle, for social legislation, the race will degenerate to a state of barbarism and will have to rise again by true natural selection. In 1954, Shankar published his book, The Aboriginal Races of India, in which he reprinted as an introduction two articles by Eugen Fisher and Arthur Keith. Fisher Fisher had been the director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. His early work in German Southwest Africa, now Namibia, claimed to show that mixed marriages 
between whites and blacks resulted in inferior offspring. On his recommendation, mixed marriages were banned in all German colonies. Adolf Hitler was a great admirer of Fischer's book, The Principles of Human Heredity and Race Hygiene, and appointed Fischer as rector of the Friedrich Wilhelm, now Humboldt, University of Berlin. Fischer joined the Nazi party in 1940. In the article reprinted by Shortar in English translation, Fischer accepts the monophyletic origin of humans and their racial classification in accordance with Mendelian heredity factors, but argues that mutations could occur in different races without any social interrelations. Individual systemic races are polyphyletic. <coughs> large racial groups differ not through a single but a large number of mutations in fixed combinations. The four major stems are Negrito, Australoid, European and Mongoloid. Arthur Keith was a British anatomist who became an expert in the study of human fossils and was a professor in the Royal College of Surgeons in London as well as president of the Royal Anthropological Institute. In his book, A New Theory of Human Evolution, he argued that humans had evolved through their tendency to live in small competing communities shaped by racial differences in the genetic substrata. Keith believed that there were three primary racial groups, Caucasian, Mongoloid, and Negroid, and claimed that crossbreeding among the groups produced inferior progeny. Hence, it was preferable to have racial segregation. <coughs> Keith's article reprinted by Shaka was a review of Guho's 1931 census article in which Keith noted that Guho had found that the Indian people were brachycephalic to a much larger extent than suspected. Keith endorsed Guho's modification of Risley's racial classification and argued that the essential and prevalent Indian racial type was an evolved form of the type found among the tribes of Central and Southern India and the Vedas of Salam. It is not entirely clear why Shankar thought it necessary to include in his book the essays by Fisher and Keith, prominent advocates of a variety of scientific racism thoroughly discredited and condemned by them. Perhaps it was to declare his continued faith in the ability of the discipline of race science to correct and improve its methods in order to produce useful knowledge. In the subsequent chapters of his book, Shankar presented detailed evidence on head shapes to classify the tribal populations of India. He argued that the Australoid was a basic stem that had mutated among the aboriginal peoples of southern India, that Negritos were to be found only in the Andaman Islands and not on the Indian mainland, and that the Munda had no affinity with Dravidians and had migrated relatively recently into India. Rojit Mukherjee has shown how serologists like Shankar would use both devious and coercive means to extract blood samples from reluctant subjects. One must hasten to add that Shashankar Shankar was a devoted teacher in the anthropology department and was much admired by colleagues and students for his kindness and generosity. His affirmation of racial science in the face of widespread criticism of his practice and his apparent belief that his own work was 50 years ahead of its time show, it seems to me, the often exaggerated authority the idea of science can assume in even the most humane of persons. So to conclude, both the physical and cultural parts of the anthropological, anthropology syllabus in the University of Calcutta were thoroughly revised in 1971. An entire paper was introduced on evolution, genetics, and race, in which biological inheritance through cells, chromosomes, genes, RNA, and DNA was to be studied. The terms race and ethnic groups were used synonymously, suggesting a stage of paradigm transition. 
serological techniques such as testing of ABO blood groups, techniques of dermatoclinics and human, human cytopathy, psychology, human psychology were part of the practical techniques. The papers on social and cultural anthropology <laughs> included Marx, Weber and Durkheim, the structural methods of Radcliffe Brown, Levi Strauss, Dumont, Leach and Needham, and cultural ecology, Stuart, Salins and Baum, as well as tribal and peasant societies in India, the caste system, and social change in modern India. One notices the more explicit stand here of the debates in the discipline between anthropology as a science and as a method of cultural interpretation. Huge changes would take place in Indian anthropology from the 1950s with the use of ethnographic methods in village studies as well as the study of urban and industrial life. Students of this department such as Andre Bete, for instance, would play a major role in that transformation. But to discuss the implications of those changes would take us beyond the first 50 years of the department. We must therefore conclude our presentation here. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for our very illustrious, comprehensive, and detailed account of the first 50 years of our department. And it's really, uh, we're humble enough to understand, uh, to see the mirror of our own past. While, uh, while listening your talk, we're really proud that we are the part of the department, and at the same time, we would like to continue our uh, anthropological intervention, anthropological research for the next few decades. It's very important for us, it's very important for us to understand when we start with prehistoric archaeology, ethnology, racial biology, anthropometric data, caste prestige, evolutionary biology, racial psychometry caste, migration, and other different facets of anthropology, which actually baffled me when I understand, when I try to understand the past of our history, which actually creates some beautiful tapestries based on which our new generations will create a new kinds of anthropological research and anthropological knowledge to our society. Thank you so for being with us. And now we are at the end of this particular one day. Uh, we are at the end of lecture, the last part of it. And now I'd like to request uh, our departmental HOD and we are at the professor, Professor S.S. Bakshi, to, uh, to present uh, the mentor. students. I am really thankful to my department for giving, this, giving me this wonderful opportunity to express the vote of thanks on this August occasion. Today we have successfully organized the Ambedkar Memorial Lecture delivered by renowned Professor Partho Chatterjee, Professor, Professor in Returns of Anthropology and Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies, Department of Anthropology, Columbia University. Uh, I hope we all have the opportunity to uh, meet uh, on similar more occasion in the near future. More than 100 participants have participated in this uh, 
in itself. On behalf of the uh, Dr. Ambedkar Chair, uh, Professor in Anthropology and the Department of Anthropology, University of Calcutta, I express my heartfelt thank to Professor Partha Chatterjee uh, uh, for his wonderful lecture. Uh, the program would not have been possible if he had not uh, given his uh, valuable time. Thank you very much, sir, for your thought-provoking, vibrant deliberation uh, on the glorious history of our department. I would also like to thank uh, Professor S. S. Bhakti, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Chair of in Anthropology of University of Canada for taking all the pain to organize such a fantastic uh, commemoration in the name of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm really thankful to my uh, departmental colleague, Sri Shubhendu Maji, for uh, opening the session. I'm, I would like to uh, express my gratefulness to my other faculty, esteemed uh, departmental faculty, colleagues, for their uh, active cooperation. Many of them are present here. I would also like to thank to all the respected dignitaries and distinguished guests from different colleges who have honored us with their auspicious presence. I would like to thank to our uh, departmental colleagues, especially uh, uh, Sri Prabhi Mukhavadhyay, librarian, and Sri Kulai Prashanu Dalal Chaudhary, lab assistant, for their active cooperation and technological assistance. I once again thank the university authority for providing all the official permissions. Especially, I am thankful to Dr. Patin Chaudhary, head of the Department of Youth and Technology, Department of Youth uh, Department, uh, 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 and Technology Department, uh, for providing the Canadian Hall for today's program. Uh, last but not the least, I thank to our dear scholars, students, for participating in this program. Thank you all. Thank you. With the food arrangement outside.